is going to need to Harry, our chair, is going to need to leave pretty soon and won't be able to, to chair this meeting today. So he asked if I would do that. And I said, yes. Um, and <laughs> just to let you all know that, um, and you probably got that little message about recording. We are recording it. So you can always take a look at this later on as well. Um, welcome, everyone. It's great to have you all here. Um, if maybe people, if, if there's anybody here that has never been to an ATJ board meeting, can you just kind of shout out or raise your hand if there's anyone here that's never been? Okay. Okay, great. So, um, Doug is going to be presenting, so we'll give you an opportunity, Doug, to be able to say a little bit about you and, um, and uh, let's see, Jeremy. is it Jer Jeremy and yep. Jeremy, um, so maybe you could just say who you are and where you're from. So I'm Jeremy Brooks. Uh, everybody just calls me Jer. Mm -hmm. And I'm the executive director at the Dispute Resolution Center for Yakima and Kittitas Counties. I come to you from uh, Vancouver, BC. I, I'm new to Washington State. Uh, when I was in BC, I participated in the Access to Justice group uh, in BC, so I, 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 I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm a youth worker by trade. I'm a mediator, arbitrator, parenting coordinator, and uh, in my most recent roles in BC, I sat on the uh, Expanding Our Vision Committee for the Human Resources Tribunal, uh, BC Human Rights Tribunal, um, as well as I was an adjudicator for the Law Society of BC, and I ran the Child Protection Mediation Program for the province. So thank you for having me here. Sure. Thank you for being here. And you are one busy person, so you fit right in. <laughs> and uh, if other folks could just maybe in the chat, uh, introduce yourselves, put who you are. So even though we might see each other in these meetings, sometimes we lose track of who's who, and it's just helpful to have that information. So thank you. And thank you all for being here. Um, so we're gonna, we've got some uh, presenters who are on tight schedules. So I'm gonna try to keep this a tight uh, meeting. And so the next item on our agenda is the September board meetings, um, board minutes, excuse me. So uh, board members, if you've had a chance to take a look at, um, take a look at the minutes, are there, um, are there any changes? Um, and if not, can I have a motion to accept the minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Great. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Put your put maybe put your that little hand thing up so Diana can count them. For board members, if you could put your little, yeah, the little hand symbol up, that would be helpful. Do you have it, Diana? And mine is a yes. So, okay, great. The motion passes. Thank you very much. And so now I um, want to introduce Sal. He's, um, we miss him. He's a former board chair for the Access to Justice Board. And uh, somebody who has been working on this project for quite a while. Um, the policy between the Washington State Bar and the Supreme Court boards um, that we affectionately call taxi cab. I can't figure out how that comes to that, but these acronyms kill me. Uh, so, but Sal is going to give us an update on this um, and the final proposal so that we can, as a board, take action on this. Um, so, Sal? Esperanza, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And I do miss being part of this board, so it's exciting being here this morning. I'm actually down in sunny and somewhat warm Tempe, Arizona. Just that to make you any jealous, but that's where I am. You should have received the additional materials, I think yesterday or the day before. I apologize for that because you know when I was on the board, I always hated late materials, but sometimes it can't be helped. And this time it could not because we just kind of got final approval on this draft. So let me tell you uh, what it is. It's a proposed policy agreement between the WSBA and all the boards that are appointed by our state Supreme Court. And the reason that we need this is that historically, we've had some conflict at times. And, and I, I will say, 
it's the exception to have conflict, at least in my experience, definitely not the rule between boards and the WSBA. And it all arises out of general rule 12.3. That's the general rule that the court uh, put in place so that the WSBA could administer and support and provide uh, staff to the court appointed boards. And where the conflict arises at times is because within rule 12.3, there's a requirement that WISBA also oversee to monitor the boards, each board's compliance. And, and so it, it's always been um, a little bit of a gray area is where does that authority that WISBA has to monitor then go into the board's uh, province of being an independent board. And there are six boards uh, at issue here. There are the practice law board, the triple LT board, the mandatory CLE, the disciplinary board, the uh, limited practice officer board, and the access to justice board. So literally uh, 23 months ago, our past uh, chair, Francis Adewale, sent me an email saying, Sal, you're the perfect person for this. Would you do it? And, and of course, I said, yes, I love the guy. Little knowing that it's going to be two years later uh, and with a lot of meetings and, and a lot of disagreements and trying to craft this policy that I would be back before uh, this board to uh, provide this report. So it's been about a two-year journey. It's meant to be a joint policy between the WSBA and the various boards. Um, and I think that we've, we've done a pretty good job here. There is a core group of about five or six of us uh, that were most interested, I'll say, is the practice of uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, the practice of the law board and the triple LT board and, and the access to justice board probably had the, the most skin in this game. And so we had three representatives from our three boards uh, together with whisper representatives working on this. So I'm just going to outline a couple of the key points and then leave a few minutes for uh, questions and discussion. I know I'm slated for 15 minutes on this, and I think I can do that because I have reported to uh, the board on this before, but I also realized we have four new board members. So I'm trying to do the mix of not having to repeat too much and yet still give the, the essence of what's going on here. So the essence is making sure from, from the board standpoint, I made it very clear when I was serving on this committee, that I am wearing my access to justice hat. I'm not wearing a former president of the Washington State Bar Association hat. And I was pretty frank. I think I said, you know, if I was um, in that chair, I would be uh, viewing this differently. But I really am looking out for the access to justice board's uh, position here. And one thing was board independence. And I think that this policy does speak to that. If you look to paragraphs 3.0 and 3.2, it mentions independence. And, and that is so important. Um, this board has to have the, um, I, I not have, must protect its integrity and protect its right to set its own course and to do what it thinks it needs to do. Um, and I think that this policy does that. One of the key points, which has never really been a key point for us, and we've always done this, but I think some of the other boards, there's been question marks on lobbying activity. I mean, that is part of what we do. We're the access to justice board. We go before the state legislature. We go before various boards and we lobby on behalf of civil legal aid providers. Just, it's kind of our core mission. This, and so if there's any question as to whether or not we could do that, I wanted to make sure it was very clear in the policy. And you'll see in your proposed policy, paragraph 3.4, that is clearly spelled out we have that authority and that's not going to be interfered with. Um, we do report, we are a direct report to our state Supreme Court. Uh, as I mentioned before, under uh, GR 12.3, um, the WSBA does monitor us. So uh, we made it clear that we do give a copy of whatever we report we give to the state Supreme Court, we also give to the WSBA. And, and again, for us, I don't think it was a big deal. For some of the other boards, I guess there had been some conflict be because the WSBA said we want a separate report uh, set out in this type of format. And, and that caused some um, conflict with those boards. I don't think we ever had that conflict. Uh, but it's clear now, uh, we don't do a separate report. We do one report, but we give a copy to the WSBA. 
Uh, a big point for some of the other boards was indemnification from the WSBA if they get sued because of their activities on their boards or their volunteers do, uh, would the WSBA indemnify them? While theoretically, we run that same risk, I really do think from a lawyer standpoint, the risk is very small that somebody would be suing us over something that we would be doing. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we are covered like any WISBA volunteer, and that's very clear in the policy. Where the next step is, I'm coming before this board uh, to ask for your approval on this policy. It's going before the five other boards, and then it'll go before the WSBA at their, and I, Diana, remind me, I think the January meeting that the WSBA has um, to approve. And then we're probably all looking for some sort of approval, whether it's just even a letter or nod, something by our state Supreme Court saying this looks good to us. But again, um, and I'll be frank with you, one issue we did not address and, and whether it needs to be addressed further on down the road, but it has been a, a, an area of conflict between us and the WSBA is whether we can go into, uh, which this board does, a working session or executive session. Um, my position was that is something that is within the authority of the Access to Justice Board. It sets its own guidelines as to when it should go in executive session. Um, but that's something that uh, is a conflict. I just want to flag it out now with the WSBA's policy saying we are always entitled to have our representative at your board meetings, even if you go in executive session. So I just want to put that out there. It may come before you all sometime down the road. We elected not to tackle that issue at this time. And again, I made it very clear. I think that we have that authority. We have to as an independent board, and uh, we set our own guidelines as to when we do it. I also just want to point out for historical sake, uh, I can't recall when we've actually gone into a hardcore executive session, except maybe when we do nomination for awards, make it very clear. But we have never excluded the WSBA main liaison, which is Diana's position. And Frank, that wouldn't be hard pressed to see when that would take place. Um, but again, it's the board's prerogative as to uh, who gets included in any type of executive session. So I've got about 10 minutes on that, um, and I'll open it up for comments or questions. Or I, I guess I'll kick it back to the board chair, because that's where it should go, uh, to open it up for comments and questions. So any comments and questions? <laughs> Thanks for queuing that up, Sil. I have a question. Then. Um, Diana, go ahead. Yes, what I'm hearing is that you want us to advocate and lobby for um, the civil legal aid agencies. Is that correct? No, Vana, not, not quite. Uh, all I'm here for my purposes today is to put out this policy to help uh, kind of reduce any future friction. Within that policy, it makes it very clear that all the boards, but as it pertains to the Access to Justice Board, has the authority to lobby um, on behalf of the board's activities. Whether this board elects to continue to do so or not, that is something for this board to decide. But I will also say that historically, we have done that, whether it's on a piece of uh, legislation, whether it's at uh, lobbying day through the um, EJC, or whether it's through rules, uh, we lobby actually at the, the state Supreme Court uh, on, on rules. So I'm not asking this board to lobby, uh, it's just something that has historically been done and I would be surprised if this board does not continue to do it. All I'm doing is saying, this is the policy which makes it very clear that oh, the ATJ board uh, can do that. Thank you, Sal, miss you. Miss you, Vanna. Uh, any other questions? You got a few hands up, uh, SB. I think oh, thank Terry. you, Terry. Thank you. I see Terry's hand. Thank you, SB. Uh, and mostly, I just want to say thank you, Sal, because um, uh, the labors, the labors of doing this, turned out to be way longer than we thought, and and uh, way more complicated. So I just wanted to thank you for all your work on this. Thanks, Terry. 
Keenan. Sal, or maybe Diana, or perhaps both of you, can you please remind me how our budget is set for the ATJ board? I'm just looking at the language in 6.3, and it says the board acknowledges that the WISBA has the authority to establish the budget for the WISBA and the boards, and I'm just trying to remember how that works. Sure, I could jump in on that. So, um, so the ATJ board has two sources of funding. One is from the Bar Association and one is from the Supreme Court. So as it relates for the Bar Association, which is really the bulk of the board's budget, um, that process happens, uh, and I'm the manager for that cost center. So the budget planning process usually starts in uh, April or May. Um, and so throughout the year, uh, the ATJ board and through its budget committee uh, works to prepare a budget um, that ultimately will go, that I will submit to um, the uh, budget and audit committee of the Board of Governors, and then uh, who obviously work with our um, uh, uh, accounting folks and, and our executive director, and then ultimately um, they review it over the summer and then they um, vote on that budget um, in September. That's usually the timeline. Um, and so depending on the year, there may be some questions from the budget and audit committee that maybe the board is proposing something that's um, more than usual. So that actually happened this past budget cycle where we're uh, requesting more funding for our state planning process. So Francis um, uh, and I were, attended the budget and audit committee. He already served on it as a board of governor member um, prepared to answer any questions. So, but then can you just, cause there's two buckets, right? So there's a Supreme Court bucket as well. So what, it's just, well, I'm just, I'm stuck on that language that says the budget. So does WISBA yes. control the Supreme Court bucket? No. And, and, and Dave, let me yeah. just remind everybody, this is the policy between the WSBA and us, right? It's not the, the policy between the court and us. Oh, so no, I, I understand. But I, I just, I just, as I read this, it would, the board would have authority to control both of those buckets. No. Uh, the Board of Governors would. Uh, no. when it says, when I, and then I think we need to maybe clarify what the budget means. Uh, again, this the only budget that the WISBA has is its own budget pertaining to us. Um, I, I can make that notation uh, and bring it back to the group. I, I, I don't have that same concern. Um, and let me just add two quick things to this. One is, I, yeah, again, historically, I think we've always had a good working relationship with the WSBA as far as funding. They've always heard us. We've always had a voice in that budget process. The other comment is, I don't think that's been true for other boards, and that's why this language is in here. In fact, other boards have had their budgets cut, uh, but allegedly, I, I guess, I, I don't want to represent, uh, but I've been told by WISBA when WISBA didn't like what they were doing. So that's why this language was in there. Any other questions? D uh, Judge Keenan, is that, did that answer your question? Well, I think it should be clarified, uh, but it answers yeah. it, it, it okay. answers my question, but I, th I think it should be clarified. So, any other questions? So there's a, um, there's a, an ask for a motion to approve this policy and do I have a motion? And in that motion, if somebody wanted to attach uh, something in there about having that clarification on the budget, where um, uh, they'll maybe putting a notation in there on that uh, to clarify that around the budget. Do I have a motion? I will move for the board to approve the the taxi cab policy uh, and encourage Sal to go back and encourage them to clarify the, that it's the WISBA budget. Second. Great, okay. Uh, any questions? Okay, so um, all those in favor, board members, if you could please raise your hands for Diana to make sure we get a good count. Either put the little hand symbol up there or thumbs up or something so that I she knows. I okay, got it. All right, great. 
Okay. All right, the motion passes. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Sal, very much for all your work on this. Look at this. We finally passed the we're, we passed it on our end. <laughs> it only Thanks, took Esperanza. <laughs> it's great seeing everyone. It's good to see you too. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gone. And, and we hope we see you again. You will. You will. Okay. okay. Great. Great. So uh, moving right along. Um, so the next uh, item on our agenda is a presentation by Doug Steves, who works closely with the Clark County Volunteer Lawyer Program. Um, and he recently um, shared information about courtroom readiness with the uh, pro bono council, um, with the um, DISCO. And um, the pro bono council recommended that our board learn more about this. And it's good information. It's um, actually looking forward to it, Doug. So um, we've got uh, 15 minutes. And I'm really good at timing people, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I'm actually gonna start my own little clock here because uh, I tend to be very verbose and so I have to watch it. Um, so hi everyone, thank you for having me here to speak to the Access to Justice Board. And I uh, thank Bonnie for setting it up and Esperanza for uh, leading all this right now. Um, so um, while I have 15 minutes, I would actually like to leave a few minutes at the end for questions. So um, I'm just gonna quickly give a quick intro to who I am. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about what I even mean by courtroom readiness. Uh, I can talk a little bit about how courtroom readiness helps not just pro se clients, but also the court system as a whole. And uh, hopefully inspire you to think about ways the courtroom readiness I'm doing uh, can be supported and expanded with the help of the ATJ directly or indirectly, because I would love to be providing this service to all 16 of the VLPs in Washington. Um, so I approached the Clark County Volunteer Lawyers Program, the CCVLP, about volunteering to provide one-on-one -on -one courtroom readiness sessions for CCVLP clients in 2018. Uh, this came about because a few years earlier, I'd, I'd stepped away from a roughly 15-year project management career path, uh, complete with the PMP certification, uh, to basically seek out something that was more in alignment with who I am and, and how I want to show up in the world. And I find that I enjoy and I'm capable of holding space for, for people who are in difficult moments and have complex emotions. And I like empowering them to find their own path forward. So initially I started an LLC called The Life Unfettered to provide coaching services to individuals. Um, having had some experience already working with folks in recovery and then uh, getting some additional coaching training. And then as it turned out, one of my early clients was a lawyer who was looking for additional support services beyond just coaching and inquired if I would wanna do that. that led to working for a number of law firms, providing a variety of legal support services and courtroom readiness. Uh, and that led to my DBA truth in litigation. Um, I found that uh, life unfettered didn't quite work in the legal environment. Um, I, I even found that my theater degree finally came in handy, helping lawyers to better understand uh, voice and body work and, uh, and, to, uh, and with uh, juror interactions in the courtroom and such. Um, I did admin work in a law firm for about a year just to get a better sense of how law firms work as a system, uh, to get more familiar with the type of paperwork that drives the process, to gain additional exposure to legal clients, and to better understand uh, the dynamics of client relationships in the legal environment and more. And, and I bring all that up in part because while there are disadvantages to being new to a field, uh, I also have the advantage of seeing the legal environment with fresh eyes, uh, a non-legal perspective, and with my own knowledge lenses of project management, coaching, and theater. And that strange mix of past experience has been incredibly helpful in, in doing what I'm doing right now. So I started volunteering for the CCBLP because I was noticing with my law firm clients just how distressed their clients could be. Um, I wanted to explore uh, working with people who were prepping for court. Um, I had witness prep in mind, but um, helping pro se individuals prepare to go to court seemed like a perfect fit for, fit for exploring this. And, and one of the first things I noticed in working with individuals uh, preparing to go to court was honestly how distressed they were about the paperwork they had usually had from a volunteer lawyer uh, that needed to be completed. They would show up to the prepare for court sessions and they would have paperwork, but they wouldn't have done it necessarily because they couldn't bring themselves to emotionally. Uh, so being distressed, uh, emotionally triggered, or emotionally compromised, you know, many of these folks struggle to listen and be present, even when they're meeting with uh, a volunteer attorney that's specifically there to help them. And, and that shows up then in court in front of a judge as well, and courtroom readiness can help with that. So uh, what I mean when I use the term courtroom readiness, um, 
talking to pro se clients, both uh, before they see a VLP lawyer and before they go to court, so that they are capable of being more centered and grounded when they do, and so they are more likely to be able to present, uh, to interact in a productive way in spite of any strong emotional aspects to their case. Um, so the sessions I provide are roughly one to two hours long, depending on the needs of the client and where they are at in the process. Um, I do my best to meet that individual where they are at. Um, so, uh, you know, emotional and psychological support during a distressing process. Um, during the sessions, we try to build trust and buy-in. We have a very short period of time with the individuals, and so uh, we want them to be able to feel comfortable and supported so that they have uh, a desire to take some of the information they're getting from uh, from me and, and use it, uh, practice with it. Because with an hour to two, you can't go through everything. Um, not like uh, It's not like they're going to have 10 therapy sessions, right? Or something like that. They have one, one, maybe sometimes two sessions that they do a follow-up before they go to court. Um, and so we're really getting, uh, getting to build trust and buy-in very quickly so that when I'm giving them homework, um, cause there's, there's only so much we can do in a session, but we can provide them, um, concepts, ideas, methodologies to practice outside of the courtroom, um, that can then help them to better prepare for. And, and, and in all honesty, uh, this, this work is theirs to do. Um, and so the courtroom readiness is there to support them to be able to have the ability to do this work on their own uh, and to feel like they've got that support and to, to be part of a community as opposed to just being left out on their own. So I give them homework. Um, I communicate a lot of important concepts around uh, the court. Uh, I provide them that homework to aid them, not just in court, but uh, in life. Um, a lot of the folks that I've talked to have, haven't had role models. They haven't had uh, any exposure to some of these, these concepts that help someone to be a little more emotionally um, centered and grounded and to be able to process some difficult emotions, uh, to be able to think critically. And so it gives them a space to be able to explore that in a safe environment where they're not being judged for it. Uh, they're being supported with um, the introduction of the information and then how to move forward. So I communicate those important concepts, give them homework, but I also just create that really safe place for the clients to be able to tell their story and to be heard. Um, I'm able to introduce the uh, concepts, like I said, around self-care, uh, but also that self-empowerment that they may have never encountered. Um, and, and all this really helps to be more calm and centered, um, even in the emotional circumstance in, in court. Um, and a lot of this started as in-person. Uh, however, with COVID, uh, it quickly moved to online Zoom meetings, which ironically was in some ways great because while in-person is better, uh, there are definite benefits to be able to meet with a client who is calling from their car or during their limited time between their life demands of jobs or stresses or uh, trying to find a safe place to be able to communicate about these things and get that support. Um, so while COVID sort of strangely influenced it, ultimately I think it actually helped to expand the services in a way that um, allows more people to access them and also to access it on their time. Um, and that's another reason why I'm really excited about the possibility of expanding this for all the VLPs, because it's something that, given the technology and the opportunities today, we can do much more easily. Um, it's not like the people in the rural areas no longer will have access to this sort of support um, and um, information. They can actually have it now uh, where it would have been much harder before. Um, it's not like we have to drive hours out to meet somebody. We can actually meet them over Zoom, which is extremely empowering. Um, so I just want to touch really quickly also on, you know, my project brand management brain, the way I look at this, I see a system, you know, and so uh, what I see is I know I talk about the distress of the clients I'm helping, but I see distress in the courtroom as well. I, you, I think you just have to sit in one um, DV docket uh, around protection orders um, and watch a judge come in and start out in a pretty decent mood. And then by the end, after they've had what, what actually yesterday, one of the judges called Judy, you know, Judge Judy moments. Um, where people are talking over each other and it's almost like a reality TV show. Um, and they, you know, they can sometimes come in with a lot of energy and enthusiasm and a lot more calmness as a judge. And you can just see that slowly eroding as they're dealing with individuals who are making their job harder, right? And so part of what I see is this process is, you know, this actually helps the whole system. If we can have individuals who are more centered and grounded, who are more even slightly aware, because let's be honest, we're not talking about perfection here. No one is going to be 100% perfect as a pro se individual with, with how they're able to operate in court. It's unrealistic. But if we get them 5%, 10% better, where they can avoid having a Jerry Springer moment where the opposing party says something and they're like, hey, you're calling me a liar or something like that, that detracts from the judge being able to do their job of getting the information, the facts, not just the allegations, so that they can make a decision 
then we're ultimately helping to serve justice um, and make it far more efficient. So in my, my opinion, as I'm looking at this, uh, the work that I'm doing helps these individuals um, to become more calm and centered. It gives them exposure right. to a, a variety of methodologies and ideas they may have never encountered before that will definitely help them prepare for even seeing a lawyer just to get the paperwork done, also for court where they can actually present more uh, ably uh, and deal with the emotions that do uh -huh. inevitably. And then um, ultimately it also helps the court system itself because they're able to run more efficiently um, and get to the decisions more quickly, to, and which in my mind serves justice overall. Um, so the benefits aren't just for the pro se clients, um, and I don't think it's hyperbole to just say that the benefits are to the whole system, um, especially when judges can get through dockets faster and, and, and be able to have more energy and enthusiasm for their own job. Um, and ultimately, it sounds, again, not hyperbole, but I think it helps the clerks and lawyers too, because there's a lot of less to have to deal with, and it's a lot easier to communicate um, information. Um, one of the things I've noticed, for example, is sometimes judges who want to help people and who will take the time to explain to a pro se client, this is what you need to do, this is how you need to do it, they then sometimes get rushed. And so they're trying to help, but then they're talking a mile a minute, and the person, even if they had a pen, probably couldn't write it all down, right? And so part of what we're having here is ideally the increase in the awareness around um, this whole issue and how we can actually take these fundamental, mundane, but basic steps to help people that ultimately helps the entire system work better. So, um, you know, I envision helping all 16 VLPs, VLPs across Washington. Um, I'm definitely interested in continuing to um, ask for help and to let folks know that this program is out here. And um, if you have ideas or ways to um, connect to resources, I am open to it. Um, and with that, I mean, I could talk for a very long time about courtroom readiness. I've tried to be as concise as possible, but um, I'm actually very passionate about it. I see how it genuinely helps people in the system. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, and thank you for all your work and putting that together. Um, are there any questions? Anyone? I don't see any questions. So um, I just wanna thank you on behalf of all of us for coming today and presenting this information. And My thank uh, you for having me, I really appreciate it. Well, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. And you're welcome anytime. Okay. okay. Thank Cheers. you. Um, so uh, now we're on the new eviction, new eviction defense rule. And Judge Keenan is going to um, share with us uh, what's been happening with that so that we can take some action, hopefully, in today's meeting. Thanks, Esperanza. So I'm standing in today for uh, board member Michelle Lucas. Uh, Michelle is actually the listed spokesperson uh, for the proposed rule. She's unable to join us today. And I chair the board's rules committee, so I was asked to present uh, instead. This rule relates to attorney representation for indigent people in unlawful uh, detainer proceedings. That's the technical language, but basically it means appointed counsel for tenants in eviction proceedings who cannot afford counsel. And the rule tries to give, I think, some more life to it follows on uh, RCW 59-18-640 sub 1, and that statute provides in relevant part that the court must appoint an attorney for an indigent tenant uh, in unlawful detainer proceedings. So given that the court must appoint an attorney in certain circumstances, and the statute also says it's subject to the availability of funding, the rule tries to give some instructions to judges, judges like me, uh, to ensure that the statute is actually carried out. And so, for example, it requires uh, the court to inform the tenant of the right to counsel. You know, right? Your right isn't so meaningful if you don't know that it exists. Uh, it requires the court to ask if uh, the individual wants counsel and then when appropriate, appoint counsel and then continue the hearing for at least 14 days if the judge does appoint counsel. Uh, the rule also provides that if the court issues a writ, a writ of restitution, which is basically an eviction order, and it hasn't yet been executed, the court can still appoint counsel. And then if, if counsel is appointed, they can seek to stay the writ. In other words, pause the eviction uh, proceedings. And that's based in part on what advocates have been seeing. And this is noted in the cover sheet for the proposed rule, where, for example, many calls to the clear hotline have been from unrepresented individuals already in uh, proceedings. 
So the board actually signed on uh, to the proposed rule as a proponent. Normally, uh, rules come to the board uh, when the court has published a rule for comment, and then it goes to the rules committee, and then the rules committee makes a recommendation to the board. Here, the board actually signed on uh, in favor of the rule when the rule was proposed to the court. So the Supreme Court now has issued the rule for comment, and the ask today of the board is for a motion and a second that the board write a comment in support of the rule. Uh, then there would be discussion. My understanding is that we have a guest here who wants to speak to the proposed rule. I think the appropriate time to do that would be when the motion has been made and seconded. And then if the motion is approved, Michelle would draft a comment for uh, for the board chair's signature. So I'll stop there. Um, any questions before we move on to that? So do I have a motion? Okay, we have a moment. Well, Bryn has moved that we uh, um, write a comment in support of, of this rule. Is there a second? I'll second. <laughs> uh, so we have a, a the motion's been made, it's been seconded. And for the board members, if I could please have a show of hands. Well, I think oh. I think this was the moment where ah, somebody yes. from somebody from Oakland, I think, wanted to. Yes, that's to right. Role. Yeah, and I can't Thank recall. You. Can't recall who that was. Thank you. Well, we have a couple people here from Oakland. So, Jim, is that you, or is that somebody else that's going to do that? That's me. Um, I think I've met most of you, and thank you, Judge Keenan, for for explaining that rule. Um, but my name is Aaron Ryan. Um, I work as Eviction Defense Program Counsel at OCLA, and along with Philippe Nab, the Eviction Defense Program Manager, um, we run the eviction defense programs at OCLA, including the appointed counsel program. And we just wanted to share with the board that we at OCLA are 100% in support of this rule um, and working with the Northwest Justice Project and other appointed counsel providers, um, we've seen a disturbing trend toward justice by geography, um, which causes real harm to tenants facing eviction. And we believe that the Supreme Court should weigh in and create some uniformity um, to prevent justice by geography for this class of cases, um, and also to ensure equitable treatment of all tenants involved in unlawful detainers. So we intend to submit comments in support of the rule. Um, we just wanted to share that um, before you take further action. And we thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of it today. Um, I believe there might be one other guest here from the Northwest Justice Project, um, Scott Crane, who might also be um, planning to speak, but I'll, I'll leave that to him if he does. Thank That's you. Okay. I was invited to speak. I, I don't need to add anything. I think Judge Keenan and, and Aaron, you've both done a great job summarizing it, but thank you for having me. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. So are we ready to take action on this on this motion? Board members, all those in favor? Diana, let me know when you have them. Yep, I have okay, it. Okay, great, great. The motion has passed. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, everyone, for all the work that's being done on this, because I know it's it's been it's it's a long haul and very necessary work. So thank you. And Judge Keenan, thank you for for getting this done before you have to leave us in a few minutes. So appreciate that. Um, OK, the next thing on the agenda is a conference update. But before I do that, let me just mention something that I should have mentioned at the beginning. Um, we have a new we, we brought on four new board members, and one of them was Carnissa Lucas Smith with this with the King County Public Defend, Defender's Office. And um, she had to step down um, due to uh, increased responsibilities and changes in her uh, situation at work. And so um, the board is, is working now to fill that position early next year. Um, we don't wanna wait till the end of her, that term. We wanna, we wanna make sure and get somebody on board. So we just wanna let folks know that if you see something that comes out later on about um, recruiting a board member that's for that position, or if you see something comes out that says we have an, a new board member, this is why. So um, just, you know, FYI. And um, so, and let me, uh, excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, so let me, um, 
give a brief update on our conference. And um, so, as you know, the Access to Justice Conference is set to happen September 28th through the 30th of 2023 next year. And the theme committee did come up with the theme of shifting justice towards accountability and trust. And, uh, and there are several committees that have been working very hard in um, dealing with all the different details. We have hired a planning company, a conference planning company, Synchronicity. Alex Martin is the person that we're working with and her staff, and they're great. They're wonderful. They're willing to do whatever it is that we need them to do right now. They're exploring space for an offsite. Apparently, somebody's trying to get a hold of me. Um, the other part is, excuse me just a second. I apologize for this. Sorry about that. Somebody really wants to get a hold of me. Um, let's see. So, and also securing rooming blocks for the conference um, and staying close in communication with the outreach committee. And uh, what I should say is the access and the access uh, accessibility community and the technology community have merged because our effort to do a hybrid conference and figuring out what that actually means. Uh, we're not gonna be able to do a 100% hybrid conference, but the, those two committees are looking at all the different issues, the technology that would be necessary, kind of platforms would support um, a semi-hybrid conference, the whole issue of language access. So there's a lot of issues that need to be taken care of and it just made more sense to combine those two committees. And so I mentioned the, the, the theme is just uh, shifting justice towards accountability and trust. So now that we have the theme, our focus, our focus now is developing the call for proposals. So the theme committee is now shifting their focus to that. And our goal is to have a soft launch of that uh, proposal application in January for organizations that'll need more time. For example, community organizations um, that are serving, you know, predominantly non-English speaking communities. These are just examples or people or organizations who are applying for the first time to present to such a conference. Um, individuals representing um, incarcerated populations. And, and uh, we've had discussions about uh, a stipend for uh, presenters and what kind of criteria will there be for that stipend. Um, and some of the other areas to, that uh, are being looked at is the fundraising and setting the conference and registration fee. So it's a busy time right now in terms of planning for the conference. Uh, and some of the people that are participating are, are, are in this meeting right now. So thank you to those of you that are helping with that. And um, we'll just keep reporting on the conference. Um, if anybody has any pressing questions right now that I could answer quickly, I'd be more than happy to. Um, otherwise, we'll continue to keep all of you up to date on what's going on. And, and you, will, um, you will also be getting information via email and shout outs and what have you for, about, about the conference. And for sure, when the um, call for proposal comes out, you'll all be getting that as well. Um, any pressing questions? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so moving right along, uh, Andrea Diaz, I, I mean, Alex Diaz, um, if you could give us an update on the Equal Justice Coalition, that would be wonderful. Sure, thanks SV. Um, hi, everyone. I think by now I've had a chance to meet with or work with most of you. Um, I just have a couple of quick updates for you on the EJC's recent and upcoming advocacy efforts. So the main focus we've had the past few months has been on the King County funding side. Um, I spent the last few months working with legal aid programs that receive funding from the King County General Fund, those being NERP, Team Child, Solid Ground, ELAP, BLC, and ULP. Um, after the King County Executive's budget proposal was released a few months ago, um, I worked together with these programs to meet with most of the King County Council 
and we asked for their support for a much needed increase to what was already included in the proposed budget. Um, that request was included in the budget committee striking amendment. And actually on Tuesday, the full council voted earlier this week to implement the striker and approve the final biennial budget. Um, on the state side, this upcoming session, the EJC will be lobbying in support of OCLA's request for a 5.2 million biennial vendor rate and contract increase for state funded legal aid programs. Um, so that's all I have on the state side for now, but we'll probably have a bigger update next time we all meet. Um, and then on the federal side, lastly, again, we're planning for a DC trip at the end of March for the American Bar Association days, and that'll be held on March 28th and 29th. Um, so that's all I really have to share for now, but uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, Alex, really appreciate it. Any questions for Alex? No? Okay. Thank you, Alex. Okay, so um may hear a little bit from um funding reports from a couple of folks. So Sessa, thank you for being here today. Um NJP. Anything good morning. To report? Good yeah, morning. uh good morning, everyone. And sorry I was uh this part of the meeting, apologize. Um I just want to add that uh <laughs> Alex has been uh, working extremely hard with the AJC in terms of trying to put together the the one pager that will be used throughout the session, and there's been a lot of work that's been going into that. And uh, so that that's not something you can show yet, but we're almost there. And 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 you know, a meeting coordinating with uh, with uh, OCLA and and then having another meeting next week. So um, looking forward to to getting all that rolled out. Um, the federal trip that Alex referred to is the the annual trip that is intended to impact the federal legal services appropriation for the 2024 budget. The, the federal budget process begins in the spring and goes throughout the year and then they pass a budget or should pass a budget by the end of the year. But so that one is for 2024. With regard to the 2023 budget, as I reported last time, we, uh, uh, we're in a continuing resolution meaning that we have basically the same level of funding as we've had this year. Um, and that continuing resolution is, is expected to, um, uh, well, the continuing resolution runs through December 16th. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's become such a routine now, but um, uh, the continuing resolutions then get, the a budget is adopted in December. And, but this past year, uh, no budget was adopted. It took another three, three and a half months to, to adopt another budget. Um, and uh, we're hoping we are not in, a, in that kind of a delay again. Um, the election results, and last, last time I mentioned that, you know, a lot was going to depend on the election results. Uh, the election results are quite positive. Uh, obviously, the, the uh, Democrats continue to uh, hold this, the Congress in the lame duck session and theoretically should be able to put forward a spending budget, a spending appropriations bill with a simple majority vote. It's not one of these uh, uh, super majority kind of things. Um, but um, uh, with the prospect of a House majority, well, not the prospect, the actuality of a House majority for the next session, there's going to be a lot of pressure put on by the uh, by the incoming uh, Republican House uh, to uh, want to impact the budget for 2023, and they will um, do so uh, or or attempt to do so by uh, uh, threatening and potentially uh, living up to a threat of uh, refusing to agree to increase the. Um, the debt ceiling, um, in which case we're talking government shutdown and they're going to be playing some real hardball as to what the budget actually looks like. So um, I am hoping that the that the Democratic majority in both houses uh, calls their bluff and uh, if, if it is a bluff and or even if it's not and really sticks to it and sticks to their budget so they can have their priorities, including uh, uh, 
significant increase for uh, legal services in the coming year. Um, and uh, we're just gonna sit tight and uh, hold our breath and see what happens by the 16th of December. That's all I have on that. Um, any questions, but. Any questions for Cesar? No? Thank you, Cesar, and thank you. That's a hard work to be doing, especially right now in this climate that we're yeah. in. Very thank hard, you. challenging. <laughs> um, okay, go, go on. Did you have something else, Cesar? No? Okay. Okay. Moving on, um, Jim, you want to report on OCLA? Sure. State funding? Yeah, happy to do so. We have submitted our uh, budget requests for both the 23 supplemental and the 24-25 biennial budgets. Um, in addition to the 5.2 million that Alex referenced for a vendor rate adjustment, there are multiple requests basically focused, as I've said before, on continuing programs that have been funded and are currently in operation um, under our authority, including the two appointed counsel programs, one for children uh, in dependency and termination cases, the other for indigent tenants in unlawful detainer cases. Um, we will continue to, we are seeking funding for the state to continue the state B, v. Blake civil relief program. Uh, the non-appointed counsel or what they, we call pre-RTC eviction defense program um, and uh, one or two other programs. Um, the total budget request, as I've shared uh, with EJC and leadership and the ATJ board is about $25 million. Uh, it is a very challenging budget year. The uh, Economic Revenue Forecast Council is about to uh, issue their next forecast. Uh, it should be out today. Uh, if it hasn't been released yet, I haven't seen it come across my email. Um, but while, you know, Six months ago, we were thinking uh, there's $4 billion in the pot unspent, ready to help us move forward with policy issues. Uh, that money will be absorbed by sizable um, uh, compensation increases that the governor's office has negotiated with the state's public employees. Um, a big chunk of it will be uh, eaten up by OSPI, the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, and a, a substantial amount will be eaten up by um, requests like ours for appropriate uh, adjustments for vendor rates, uh, particularly to address the significantly in increased costs of operations that all state vendors are experiencing. Um, I anticipate uh, a fair amount of difficulty in securing everything that we have asked for. Um, and it's kind of awkward this year, given that essentially the legislature will either have to roll back legislation, um, creating appointed council programs, or it must fund those programs at their true cost. Uh, and that leaves um, more discretionary funding choices uh, in, in a little bit greater peril. So the entirety of our request will show up in the governor's budget. We're a judicial branch agency, so all judicial branch budget requests flow through, uh, appear in the governor's budget as we have requested, um, and then the funding of January. Thank you, Jim. Do we have any questions for Jim? Okla. Uh, Bryn? Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Jim, for the update. I have a question about your, your comment that the legislature will either have to roll back legislation creating appointed counsel or fund it at its true cost. Um, is there a... a any realistic threat that they would actually roll back? Are there actual discussions about um, removing that right? Thank you. No, I have not heard any, but you know, that's the premise of our budget request is this is what it takes 
uh, and the statutes, both statutes, do include uh, subject to appropriations language. So we really do re require the, the legislature to appropriate the funds. Thank you. Any other questions for Jim? Okay, thank you very much, Jim, for being here and presenting that. Um, we're not going to have a report from LFW. Caitlin was not able to join us uh, this month, so we'll hear from her at another time. Um, but Natalia, I saw you're here, so you can report on the campaign for equal justice. Thank you, SB. Hi, everyone. Natalia Fior with the Campaign for Equal Justice at Legal Foundation. And uh, this is a report on the private funding that we raise from individuals and law firms and companies, um, just as a reminder, coming on the heels of all of the federal funding updates. So great work by Jim and Alex and Cesar and all of that. Thank you. So the Campaign for Equal Justice, um, we raise about $2 million annually. We're at about 1.7 million so far. Our goal this year is 2.1 million. All of the funds we raise go right into the grant pool for the Legal Foundation of Washington, just for anyone on, on the call who may not know about that in our process. Um, we have a few big initiatives, several now, I guess, that we do year round to raise funds. So I dropped um, a link for our Goldmark Award Luncheon. That's gonna be February 17th. We're excited to be back in person yes. um, in the Westin in Seattle. And we, uh, if you go to this page, you'll see um, some more exciting news. Michelle Storms is gonna be the award recipient this year for the Goldmark Distinguished Service Award. Mm -hmm. Yes, big round of applause. Yes. Um, total, very, very deserving, such a powerhouse in our state for civil justice. So very excited uh, to honor Michelle. And then our keynote is Twyla Carter, who is um, Chief Executive Officer yes. uh, at Legal Society, Legal Aid Society of New York. So another true powerhouse, also has local roots, um, an alumni of Seattle U Law School. So it's going to be a wonderful program. And uh, please mark your calendars February 17 at noon. We will have a live stream virtual option as well, just to make it accessible for folks who can't travel to Seattle or may not may choose not to in February, uh, depending on where you live. So we will have that as well. Um, and it, it'll just be a super fun event. So the campaign high level, we, uh, we also are um, honoring 30 years of the campaign for goal justice this year. It was started in 1992. So that's a fun milestone. Wanted to make sure you all knew. We do a big end of year mailing and we kind of played on that theme, asking folks to give $30 a month or, you know, $30 or 300 or 3000, right? Depending on their donor level. So maybe we'll see an increase this year around that, but um, just wanted to shout that out. We also are in the midst of our law firm campaign, which raises $700,000 for us every year. It's a giant fundraiser. Mm -hmm. We're about half of the way there, a little, little more than half of the way to our goal. We just wrapped up our associates campaign, which is a really fun effort um, to engage younger and newer attorneys in the work of civil legal aid and introduce them to the legal aid world. I dropped the link in there for our recent campaign. It's a two week campaign. This year we had 14 firms join us. So an increase from 12 from last year. This is the fourth annual year of this campaign. And these firms compete against each other which only helps us raise more and more money. We have a few awards we give out and they get really into it. So it's really fun. Big news is their goal was $175,000. They raised $270,000, wow. 150% of their goal. Yeah, if you take a look at this page and you scroll down, you'll see the leaderboard at the bottom with the whole list of firms. You can see who's involved, who's giving. Val Crocker and Vertitas Amala swept two of the awards this year and k &L Gates got one of the awards as well. So um, an amazing effort by the young folks in our firms. and then. An organic piece of this too is that we've also started seeing a lot of partners giving as well because they're inspired by their associates who are giving. So it's been super fun. Um, over 750 donors gave during the campaign. 300 of them were brand new. So it's just a great 
pipeline into the campaign and future leadership for this board, for all groups um, around Washington State. Those are some of the big things the campaign is up to. Um, I'll take some questions if anyone has them, but I don't have any other updates beyond that. Thank you very much, Natalia. Any questions? No questions? Well, let's just hope that everybody keeps giving, right? <laughs> yes. And that we fill those coffers. We need them to be able to provide the services that are much needed by folks around our state. So thank you very much for all your work, Natalia. Um, so that takes care of all the main topics in our agenda today. And one update that I do want to let everyone know about is that we will not be having a um, public uh, ATJ board meeting in December. The next time we will meet will be January 27th. So you get your December back. <laughs> um, and any other announcements that anybody has you want to share? Uh, Marcin? Hi. So I didn't know we weren't having a December meeting. I am uh, have been the liaison for the District and Municipal Court Judges Association. I'm retiring as a judge uh, at the end of my term. And so this will be my last meeting with you folks as, mm. the, uh, as the liaison. So it has been an absolute pleasure seeing all of my friends and new friends. And thank you for letting me uh, be a part of the Access to Justice Board for the last couple of years. Thanks. Clean. We want to thank you and, and wish you all the best in all the good things that are going to be coming towards your way. But thank, thank you, you so much for taking the time to be part of these meetings, part of these, this board. And uh, that's it's what's necessary is to have that cross kind of connection yeah. between um, the different areas in this legal community. So thank you and best of sure. luck to you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Um, anybody else? Any other announcements? or updates? Okay, not seeing any. Okay. Happy holidays, Wonderful. everyone. Oh, yes, that's right. We won't see each other till January. Happy holidays. Yeah, and Thank new you, year. <laughs> yeah, and new year, exactly. Be safe, stay healthy, and we will see you in the new year. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you Thank for being you. here. Bye. Bye.